This is Support is Sexy, Episode 82, with Leslie Bradshaw, Managing Partner at Made by Many. Welcome to the Support is Sexy podcast. I'm your host, Elaine Fluker, entrepreneur, author, producer, and founder of Chic Rebellion Media. Five days a week, Monday through Friday, I talk to women entrepreneurs who share their journeys and the true stories of their wins and their lessons and give you insight and inspiration to take your business and your life to the next level. Here we go. Hi, everyone. Welcome to a new episode of Support It's Sexy. I'm so excited to have you here. You know, it just would not be the same without you. So today we are welcoming Miss Leslie Bradshaw. And Leslie is the managing partner of a company called Made by Many. And she is also co-founder of a company she was formerly with called Jess Three. And among the many things that Leslie talks about in this episode, great advice on being in the technology space, starting a startup, uh, going back into the job market and all of those things she talks about. But I'm also so happy, proud, thankful, grateful to her for being open about the tumultuous time of her journey in her personal life and in her business. And for me, it just really touched me because it's the reason that I created Support is Sexy as a community and a podcast, because I wanted a space where women, successful women, especially women who are up to something, could come and be honest about their experiences, not just sharing the success, which we all love to hear, and the strategies, of course. But as I say, we want to wrap all of that in storytelling and really get the story. So Thank you, Leslie, for being so open about your story and sharing that with us. And Leslie also gives, of course, great advice on how to get through those times, how she got through those times and took a step back in order to move forward. So some other great things that Leslie shares in this episode, the importance of curiosity and finding your tribe, the benefits of approaching business like a team sport, especially softball, the value of the unconference, which I thought was very interesting why you shouldn't go straight from college to running your own business, how to take a step back and how that's different than a setback, how to recognize a toxic business relationship, and yes, those do exist, the dangers of the quote-unquote personal brand, which we all hear a lot about. Leslie has great opinions on that. Also, how to create your ideal job or career universe, why strong is the new sexy, why as a doer you must get your voice out there, And she also shares some super cool ways to pay it forward, which I love. So listen out for that. And in addition to all of that, Leslie also has some great resources. So you want to make sure to go to supportissexypodcast.com to check those out. I link to some of the articles that we reference in here authors, new businesses that she mentions. Also, Leslie was kind enough to share with us the framework that she uses to evaluate new job opportunities and determine your next career move. So you can take a look at that as well. Great information, great resources. As I said, I so appreciate that as well as Leslie just sharing her story. So I know you're going to enjoy this. I certainly did. So without further ado, Leslie Bradshaw. So, Leslie, thank you so much for joining us for an episode of Support is Sexy. I'm excited to have you here. Really excited to be here as well. I really love the whole concept. I think it is such a great way of of casting it. Support is definitely sexy. Yeah, thank you. Now, when did you first fall in love with entrepreneurship? So my parents, uh, they are farmers and they run their own business. And so ever since I was very little, I've been a part of a kind of an entrepreneurial culture. And if I really even look at my DNA and my heritage uh, coming across the Oregon Trail six generations ago, um, this concept of pioneering has just been like it's just within me. Like I just feel it into like my very bones. And when I had the opportunity to kind of start my own business in my 20s, I, I immediately jumped on it. And there's kind of many stories from there, but it's, it's always been a part of me. Did you ever at any point think that you would have just a quote unquote normal career or because it was so, it sounds like so embedded or ingrained in you, it wasn't even consideration. You knew you were going to do something of your own. I do think that there's this kind of really limited choice set that we all grow up with, like a doctor, an engineer, a policeman, a Mm -hmm. firefighter, and a teacher an astronaut. So there's like six jobs right. you can have. Right. Uh, I initially thought I was going to be a lawyer because I wanted to wear a suit and I wanted to, you know, be a serious lady. And I wanted to be like the people that I saw on television. And I realized quickly that there's many other expressions of business. And, um, you know, it isn't just about obviously the way you dress, but it's also 
what are you doing in law? And when I was uh, working as a paralegal for a few years, I, I realized like this isn't actually like the substance of this job is not exciting to me. The business of law is exciting and winning the, the accounts and coming up with a strategy, trying to convince a global brand to bring all of their business to your law firm. That's the stuff I got really excited about, but it's not billable. And mm -hmm. it's also not really the whole, if you're going to work at a, a law firm, you really should be passionate about the law, which I wasn't. So did you study law in school? I did. No, I, I studied for the LSAT pretty. Um, I took one of those Kaplan courses one summer after I graduated from undergrad and undergrad. I did a lot of social sciences, gender, economics. Um, and you know, some of the fear that people have, I think, is, well, gosh, what do I do with my undergraduate degree? It might have been in like a liberal arts field. It doesn't have a clear trajectory and a clear path the way that something in like the harder sciences might. And so uh, there's a great line from Madagascar that I like to use mm -hmm. the, uh, the first one with Chris Rock and he's turning 30 and he's working out on a treadmill in Central Park with his buddy, David Schwimmer, the giraffe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and Chris Rock says, you know, David Schwimmer's like, what are you going to do? It's your 30th birthday. And he's like, well, I don't know. I might go back to Africa. I might go to law school. So he's like, <laughs> you know, like right. we've all done, which is like, maybe, maybe I go back home. Maybe I go out and get a, you know, a professional finishing school degree. And it's more of a default as opposed to going into that field for future or for additional education, because you know that to advance your career, you need that master's as opposed to, gosh, I'm just scared of life and I don't know what else to do. So I'll just bury myself into the books and to some more debt mm -hmm. because that's at least, at least I know that I can do that. And I think I was almost going down that path, but then was saved by entrepreneurship. <laughs> How did it entrepreneurship save you at that point? Were you introduced to an opportunity, as you mentioned earlier, and then sort of went for it? Or did you make a decision that it was time for you to try it? Was it? More, it was more of an opportunity. I, I had been working in kind of digital trademark, um, kind of the field of online brand management, it was called in like 2005. So this concept of domain name squatting and phishing scams and helping police those with these lovely cease and desist letters that I was mm -hmm. mail merge batching, you know, taking a big spreadsheet and sending out 400 letters at the same time. Um, from there, I, you know, I'd gone on and done some just online brand management where it was about policing other people's brands on the internet or helping produce insightful customer reports that took what was happening in these threads on MySpace and Facebook and in message forums and kind of coming together around different themes and giving those insights to executives. And they were fascinated by it because the internet had been sort of either a lot of noise to them or it had been a place where maybe they would have, uh, you know, one of the, the chain letters would go viral. Like it, it was still kind of early days in the internet, but I was able to kind of pull forth really insightful, fun stuff. And while I was there, I'd met some people in the technology community in Washington, D.C., who were all kind of starting to do cool stuff. And I imagine this just is like when jazz emerged or when a certain fashion emerged or when feminism, like these different movements are just like a couple cool people hanging out at a coffee shop or kind of passing the word on, saying like, oh, you seem a little different. Like you should, you should come join us. And all of a sudden I was spending all this time after work and on the weekends just immersing myself in this culture and learning and being around engineers and designers. I brought more of a business strategy. I bought more of like a, I would say kind of, I guess, copywriting, but also just contextualizing social science, you know, thinking more about the end user. And, and that's really where the opportunities started cropping up is because I was around people who were thinking about the world a little bit differently, but also kind of like a dog whistle, we could all kind of hear each other. Mm -hmm. Now, how do you get to, how do you advise people to do that? Um, in other words, tap into a different sort of network than what you're already on the path to do. Is it just paying attention to that curiosity and then finding those people that are sort of, that sort of become your tribe that are into something different, like you said? So the best thing that you can do when it comes to the um, kind of networking side of this component is go to the, the unconferences, right? You, mm. The major conferences that are sponsored by big names and like you got South by Southwest and CES, you know, there's a lot of things out there that are um, really big banner things, but that's just a lot of noise and maybe some signals. Um, I don't know if they're still active, but bar camps were really big mm -hmm. when I was um, on the come up back kind of 2007, 2008. And those were places that were unstructured and that you kind of organize on the day of, um, but any kind of unconference scenario I always found to bring together really interesting kind of scrappy people with a lot of interesting backgrounds 
uh, anything that's touted as networking, I think is also not a place to network. Right. Any networking because, events are the place to yeah, avoid, right? Yeah, it's like Fight Club. Like you really like the first <laughs> right. rule of like unconference is, is to keep it loose and to keep it organic and keep it more like a salon of like an exchange of ideas when it's over manufactured and it's sponsored and over, you know, you've got too much of that in it. You're going to have people there for the wrong reasons. Mm-hmm. You know, people that are just trying to convert business, people who are selling some sort of software for nineteen ninety five a month and they're trying to sign you up or your company. Mm-hmm. Um, what you really want is people who are in it for the love of the game. Um, academic institutions, I found, you know, there's some interesting things when I was in DC, like American University and GW and Georgetown would have, you know, different things that would bring students and practitioners together. And kind of at that nexus, interesting things happen because you have people who have time and energy and effort that are studying theory. And in the meantime, you've got people on the front lines doing the executional piece and like you kind of come together and, you know, come up with cool ideas. And as a practitioner, you have access to actual clients or customers or things that you can test. And then the academic students I always find to be just such a cost effective, ambitious, hungry Mm -hmm. labor force. They haven't been jaded yet. Nope. And, uh, and I love partnering. I've had just some real wonderful experiences with college students in my companies. What would you say has um, informed just that part of you that is open to being curious about other things? Is that sort of who you were as a little girl? What was a young Leslie like growing up in Oregon? (laughs) So I grew up in Oregon from ages 12 through high school, ages zero to 12. I was in Lake Tahoe, Northern California, and we lived at the foot of a forest. Mm. And I would just be out there for days. I would just play around. I would have my own forts. I would whittle with wood. I would collect crystals. Um, A young Leslie was definitely self-occupied and very interested in kind of building structures and things. Mm -hmm. I did some Rube Goldberg competitions when I was younger. I worked with motors and Legos. And I just was interested in how things kind of worked. Uh, but where I think present day Leslie really draws from has more to do with being in uh, team sports and what it means to do life together with, with a group of people, uh, aimed at a shared vision and goal and everyone bringing a slightly different talent to the table. And, you know, I know that men's sports certainly have some of those same tenants, but men also kind of, they swing for the fence in baseball and, you know, home run is part of a strategy mm-hmm. Whereas in softball, which is what I played uh, for 13 years and almost played in college is, you know, it's really like a chess game and you're very strategic about how you set your lineup and one person's goal is to get on the base. Then the next person is to move that person one move over and then, you know, get them on all the way through to, to home and score. And that concept of knowing to get how to work together to have incremental success that led to like overall achievement and, and just sticking out hard work mm-hmm. and discipline. And I see it now in myself when some people are ready to give up. But if you've been given a directive, that coach tells you something, you do it. And you do it until it's done. And you try to do it at or above the level of expectation. Uh, so I would definitely say that team sports inform like the kind of work ethic discipline side. My parents being farmers and having to work on the farm starting at age 12 also influenced that. Uh, I was a little bit... Um, not super into that when I was in sixth grade, but I'm glad now that they made me do it. And then, um, yes, there's definitely like a curiosity and a creativity, but I like mostly being around the people that are super hyper creative. And I'm usually there to kind of help take their creative vision and package it in a way that can be consumed or sold or, um, amplified in a way. And what, at what point did the idea for the business that you were going to move forward with or be a part of come to you then at, once you were around these groups and in these different meetups and that kind of thing, what point did you say, that's it, that's the thing that I want to do that makes sense based on what I'm into and what I want to experience right now? So hindsight is not only is I have 2020, but it's also gives you a chance to have a real clean narrative. So I can sit here and tell you like it was super strategic. Of course, and, it's never like that when yeah, you're going through nev- it, right? Yeah, when you're going through it. So I had worked at that point in the legal field, in the communications field, in the brand management field. Um, I'd run accounts and projects. And so I had sort of a nice tool set that rounded out my professional self so that I could kind of foundationally like throw a business on top of it. I think anyone coming straight out of college thinking they're going to start a business is real. It's a big gamble. And, you know, you have people like the Mark Zuckerbergs of the world who pull that off. But ultimately, if you're going to really de-risk 
starting a business, having a few other jobs to kind of see how someone else runs their business is really, really important. And also seeing, you know, where are your strengths? Where are you going to need to hire? Um, you know, it's not ever just the job you think like, oh, we're going to have this business and it's going to be marketing services. Well, guess what? You also have to do HR and facilities and, um, you know, account management, accounting, like all of that stuff comes along with the actual delivery of awesome marketing campaign work. And that is often underestimated. You know, I talked to some of the agencies that I mentor, some friends who always say to me, you know, Leslie, I spent a third of my time winning new business, a third of my time collecting money and chasing down and managing that current business. And then I have a third of my time that I actually execute. And I think we often t- sell our entire self, you know, let's say 10 units of labor thinking, oh, I can deliver against all that. And then we disregard and forget that there's, or don't even, aren't even aware that it's going to take another five units of labor to manage that business. So you end up working extreme hours, which I, I certainly did. So back to the question of, you know, when did I know that I wanted to start a business? It was really being around a particularly creative person with whom I happen to have a relationship with, um, on the personal side, which is a whole other can of worms, happy to talk about a little bit, but Mm -hmm. He was just so creative and had such potential as a designer, but just really didn't have the business sense that would able to kind of manage and put parameters around it and deliver at a high level for an end client, even though his visual design was at a level that was surpassing many of the top firms in the world. So I I really stepped in and kind of opportunistically took it upon myself to kind of start helping and also, you know, out of uh, both an ambition for doing something bigger than my job was letting me do at 24 years old. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I was kind of bored in my day job, but it was also a little bit of altruism kind of like, okay, this guy I'm dating doesn't seem to have a clue about how to formulate a grammatically correct sentence. Doesn't really understand (laughs) how to manage money, but gosh, he's like a highly creative, yeah, highly creative genius. So uh, my, my track record now that was 10 years ago. So for the last 10 years, I typically find myself partnering with people with a really potent, like kind of almost like a savant level creative vision and then they need help kind of bringing that vision to life. And I you know, say I have the vision to get the vision done. So my advice there would be, you know, what part of that equation are you? Are you the Sheryl Sandberg who executes, manages, packages, operates it? Or are you the Mark Zuckerberg with that, you know, seeing or Steve Jobs type where you have you see the world in ways that haven't even been imagined yet. But you know how to you know how to conceive of that future state. Now, that first company, was that Jess 3 that you started with? Yes, yep, with oh. Jesse. With Jesse. Oh, okay. Uh-huh. Makes sense, yeah. Jesse. Of Jess there you three. go. So what was that? Um, uh, we don't have to dive too deep into it, but what yeah. was that experience like in launching a new business that was, which was very successful, but also having the relationship piece of it? So we did that for six years together, and from 2006 until 2012, and the first part of it was it was so invigorating and exciting because we were taking on a new slice of the internet. We were looking at data sets that were being created through tweets and people tagging things on delicious, that bookmarking site. Uh, We'd go to Flickr and we were just looking at all these places where people were creating content. And then there was meta information layered onto that content. We could then pull that meta information and storytell with it. So if you're you know, at the Super Bowl 45, like we were with uh, NFL and Visa was the sponsor. And we were able to take all these conversations. We had 2.4 million tweets that we processed around that Super Bowl. And we were analyzing what fans were saying, what they were saying about players, uh, looking at time of day and looking at tonality of the conversation. On the flip side, we would do really fun kind of visual activations at places like Pitchfork, Austin City Limits, and we were uh, the sponsor there, American Express, wanted to take social conversation and just make this like kind of beautiful, chaotic, interesting world. So we had these 40 foot long, 10 feet tall interactive screens that were taking in four square check ins and Flickr photos and just mashing it up and just making this kind of cool artistic installation. And so for us, it was an art form, but it was also using available content and data that normally prior to this moment where big data and even like the internet existed to create content, you would hire artists and you would hire copywriters. And all of a sudden you now have those things, just these kind of um, stockpiles of content, stockpiles of photos. And as long as it's publicly available and tagged in a certain kind of creative commons way, you can suck that through an API or an RSS 
So that's what we did. And that was really exhilarating and exciting. And that's considered data visualization. That's the kind of agency it was, right? Yeah. So data visualization was our kind of like the modality that we chose and our kind of pitch was we're a creative agency so we can help you with a campaign, with a live Mm -hmm. activation. Maybe you're launching a product and you want to kind of storytell around it and you want to do some infographics or you want to do what we call kind of like a snackable content buffet where you'd want to release like one or two pieces of content on social media at the time Instagram hadn't been invented yet but you know Flickr is where we started and delicious and later Twitter and Facebook and then later you know moving into things like Instagram and Pinterest and other social platforms and you know it was exhilarating but gosh it was also exhausting because we were trying to outsell the incumbents so you have these AKQAs and RGAs and Wyden Kennedys and huge and big spaceship and these established companies and then companies that had come in the last 10 years to try to disrupt that. So you're really doing kind of the ginger Rogers, right? You're backwards and in heels and you're trying to keep up with Fred Astaire. Mm -hmm. And that piece is not to be underestimated. I mean, that piece meant that our pricing was a little bit off and we were under, we were undercutting people for the price but we were making that up by working extra hours and having less labor available. So I didn't, I was the only project manager for the first four years. Wow. So I'm managing. And you worked on big projects. Yeah. And I'm managing upwards of 30 projects. And so my workload was such that, and I am not exaggerating when I say I worked over a hundred hours a week for the first four years. And it was something that I took pride in and I made sure to execute to the best of my abilities. But The things that were sacrificed, first and foremost, was my health. Uh, I gained over 60 pounds, and I was almost 200 pounds uh, by the end. I had very strained relationships with friends and family because I was always distracted, always checking my phone, always nervously thinking that something was about to drop. Mm -hmm. I was never fully present with people. Um, Yeah, health-wise, you know, not only was the weight gain there, but my skin, my teeth, my hair, like everything was manifesting this fact that I was sleeping very little. I was drinking a ton ton of caffeine, like just so much caffeine. It was ridiculous. And I would go big spurts of time to that I was forgetting to eat. And then when I finally remembered, it was like, all I needed was a buffalo and a bear. And it was like on that Oregon trail game or something. I just needed to eat like 500 squirrels or something. Um, and, and so that imbalance was very, very difficult. And then the last piece of it, and I'm happy to say honestly, that it was a very toxic relationship with my business partner, because he, although very genius, very smart, very talented, was also not a nice person. Mm. And my thinking was, oh, I'll just use my Care Bear tummy and I'll just melt him with kindness and I will just use all my strength to really change him and help him. And that's just a real fool's errand, you know, trying to come into a situation and invest that much, right? You're investing your time, your energy, your heart, your bank accounts, your professional reputation with someone who ultimately doesn't treat you well, doesn't treat other people well. Uh, Glad that I did go through that whole experience because it's, you know, just a bunch of fun stories. Uh, but I would never do it again. And I made a real conscious decision when I turned 30 years old to leave. And that was a really um, very clear cut decision for me. There was no qualms about it. Cause I said to myself, you're 30 years old and this is not the life you want. This is not who you want to be with and not how you want to be treated. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing that. I appreciate it. And especially yeah. because um, one, just working with the partner is something I know people, uh, uh uh, love interest is something mm-hmm. that, you know, a lot of us go back and forth about when we're in that situation, but then hearing how the parts of it that can go well, and then the parts of it that for whatever reason might not be well, because you could have, uh, well, you tell me, it, it sounds like you could have ended up just staying in that relationship because of the business. You know, it's different than just a regular breakup when you have so much tied into it. So the decision to walk away, I imagine was, even though it seems like it was very clear, was a very weighty one, especially a successful business. Yes. And I say it's clear. And that was after six years of trying to make it work in every which way possible. I would say, okay, well, what if I play with this variable and I have, I bring in some more senior people so that he feels like the company's being run in a different way. Or what if, um, you know, he only checks in on Mondays and Fridays or we present a status report to him. And I kept thinking if I just changed a few of the things that might, you know, that were kind of upsetting to him or his, his frustration, then, oh, that would be it. But truly, you know, in a business, like nothing is ever going to be perfect. There's a point at which you have to ship it. You have mm-hmm. to get it out the door. You know, my whole life I've been a high achiever. And so I shared his vision for excellence and I appreciated 
that about him and was attracted heavily to that. But then, you know, there's excellence and then there's perfection. And perfection is something that is a, a white whale. And, you know, the, that we couldn't achieve that perfection level really just kind of drove him nuts. And um, so in that partnership, uh, I would say that I could have easily shielded myself from him 70% of the time and just kind of gone to the office, done my work, had a great team around me, had a great set of clients and been really professionally very happy. But then it came, you know, a project wouldn't go well or he felt out of the loop and he'd come at me with uh, what I called the the dragon effect, which he would just billowing smoke and fire and come charring, you know, the whole, the township and burning down all the houses. And, you know, it was very, um, it was very destructive and very hard to build back after that. You know, there were years where we would have 100% turnover in a division, like our engineers would all leave because Mm -hmm. of the way he reacted to something and that rebuilding. And it just felt like Sisyphus, right? You're pushing that rock up the hill, you're pushing that rock up the hill. And, you know, yes, could I have kept doing it? But I just, I knew better. And I said, you know, I don't have to keep doing this. I'm choosing every morning to continue to put myself in this line of fire. And I have God given abilities and amazing network and family and friends that want better for me and I want better for myself. But it was very hard. It was, it took me about a year and a half to really think through the whole process, work with an outside consultant, and finally a very intensive six month process of what I called Operation Shawshank Redemption. <laughs> What's in Operation? Which, yeah. In which I escaped from prison right. <laughs> by going through SHIT. And, uh, and that was where I really got very focused about selling part of my partnership back, where I got focused about. Uh, delegating and skilling up people so that they could take over and also being financially responsible as an officer of the company to set up as much as possible recurring retainers, making sure clients were signed on, everything was stabilized. So when I did leave, it was as a professional would leave any scenario that Mm -hmm. that would be a a very, it's not just giving a two week notice. It's like, this is a professional transition at the C-level. And I wanted to execute that really well. So that's why I worked with an outside partner, Karen Vanderlyn. She had been a partner at PwC, and she really understood how professionals exit scenarios like this. So it was very, very beneficial and awesome. Good for you. If I can kind say, of fun, too. And, and kind of fun. And I was going to say, I'm yeah. proud of you. A lot oh, of people okay. stay way too long. That's fantastic. So when you moved on, what was your vision? When you after you crawled through the crap and got free, <laughs> when yeah. did you, um, what was your vision once you got out on the other side for yourself, your health, everything, the kind of business you wanted to go into next? Did you already have that plan? What was that stage like? So I had probably two or three chapters after that, that I kept thinking I had kind of cracked the code. And then once I did think I got there, then I thought, Oh no, 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 you're just beginning grasshopper. So step one was really regaining my health and, Um, that had to do not only with my physical health and my weight, but I was having a very hard time recalling my vast vocabulary. I was having a hard time formulating sentences. I was so burnt out and so fatigued for six years. I was running and gunning and powering myself with crap that I just needed to just lay fallow, Mm -hmm. you know, to borrow a term from farming. Like I just needed to let the nutrients return to my soil before I started planting my next crop. And what better place to do that than in Miami, Florida? Okay. And, <laughs> what better place? Uh, so I really look at that time as a time of just being in a kind of a figurative uh, hammock and just being rocked back to health. I was able to find an incredible, I, I call him my coach because he's more than just a trainer, but his name's Dempsey Arias and just a great man, a great husband, a great father and someone who really helped me think about my physical goals because as an athlete, you know, I wanted to have strength. I didn't want to just have that superficial, like, Oh, I just want to do some cardio and like get skinny. Mm-hmm. It was like, no, I like, I want to be strong and right. I want to, I want to reclaim my body from where I had taken it, which was just kind of off the rails. So there was a strength and a nutrition component. I worked with clean food. Miami It was a great delivery service that, um, you know, both of these things I was able to afford because I had done well professionally. And so I recognized that, yes, this is an investment in myself and I could go to grad school with this money or I could get my health and body back. And once I do that investment, then I'm going to protect it with everything I've got because I've now, you know, I've got, you know, a significant amount of money um, sunk into that. I mean, we're talking at least thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000, you know, just with to the, kind of reclaim that back. Right. And, so uh, this was with the coach, the nutritionist mm-hmm. and being away. Coach- and, and buying my food, um, in these kind of like prepackaged, highly like well 
thought out as far as the macronutrients and they were tasty, but healthy. Mm-hmm. Um, so they were helping me achieve, um, not only the physique and the physical stuff, but it was giving me energy in the gym. I think there's a, a great new movement among women where strong is the new sexy and yeah. that you need food to fuel you. Like gone are the days of just like this fat free start of yourself, no carbs, BS, like you need real good food, but you know, it needs to be a balanced meal. And that's what clean food Miami did for me. And then, um, I worked a little bit on a startup down there in Miami. Uh, we looked at some interesting technologies that were kind of looking at large sets of kind of text based articles, let's say from the associated press or Reuters, and then taking that text, hitting a database of images and then stitching those images together and making kind of like a bit of a Ken Burns effect of video and then being able to have that publisher monetize that content at a higher value. And in general, you know, some good hunches there, but uh, it ended up, like as many startups do, spending a little bit too much money and going in the wrong direction. By the time we kind of had a better direction to go, tried to raise some more money, wasn't able to, and eventually shut the company down after about a year and a half. And once I reached that end of that year and a half, so now I've spent a year and a half in Miami getting healthy, getting my mind right. I'm professionally kind of starting to ramp back out of the the burnout stage. Mm -hmm. And I job hunted and I put myself back out on the market in a way that I hadn't right after just three. And, um, you know, going to Miami was just going to happen. Like I needed to go somewhere warm and safe and kind of cost effective. But when I got out of um, the startup and in that situation, I said, okay, I want back in the game. Mm -hmm. Like I want to go to San Francisco or New York I want to be at a big brand or, you know, a well-funded startup or someone doing something great. And I want to be back amongst my peers that would challenge me to be the best version of my professional self. Did you have any fears at, um, about the stepping away sort of, even though you were still involved in the startup world, but I know that's another piece of it. Some people feel like once I move away from my peers or go to, you know, Miami, as opposed to New York or anywhere else, um, this, this feeling of, am I going to miss out kind of thing, fear of missing out, fear of missing out. It is definitely a real thing. I would say there was the couple of thoughts I had, I thought I could go to Miami and it's the most relevant, irrelevant city because there's a lot of great stuff going on down there. You have like this art culture, you have the gateway to the Americas, you have art Basel, it's just like the new South by Southwest. So mm-hmm. in some ways there were like these kind of cool, components that were just culturally relevant beyond just technology that I felt very privileged and and lucky to be around and among and meet some really neat artists and photographers. And then on the flip side, I just wanted to check out. I wanted to be left alone and and be in a place where I had my coach, Dempsey, and I had my best friend, um, her name's Jen. She's still down there and we've known each other for about 10 years So I I just needed one emergency contact Mm -hmm. (laughs) and one, and, you know, and maybe a backup emergency contact. And I didn't want anything beyond that because I knew that I could easily find myself advising 10 companies and doing six side projects. And I had to really rehabilitate myself from my addiction to work Mm -hmm. and I needed to reframe my relationship to my job. And so if I went to anything other than like a city that had kind of a bit of a calmer take on. Because, I mean, there's, let's be honest, Miami is a manana culture. It's like, oh, yeah, manana, you know, yeah. yeah. We can be 30 beach, minutes late. It'll be fine. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And, like, it, and it was kind of good for me. And and by the end of it, I got a little stir crazy. And I was like, okay, if someone shows up late to a meeting one more time, I'm going to snap. Right. <laughs> but in the early days of it, it was just a nice, gentle, hammock place. And after major burnout, just depends on what level of burnout you're on. You know, I was going so hard for those six years that – if I didn't step back, I would never step forward again. Mm -hmm. And I would just compound my injury. And I would just be building on a a very rickety foundation. So I I just knew that there was something inside of me that just said, throw the brakes on, take a couple, you know, and it doesn't have to be forever. And that's where kind of like a a micro retirement, I've heard it called. I've Mm -hmm. heard maybe sabbaticals are even like real thing in companies where you've served for a couple of years. I know Intel does it after a certain period of service, you're able to take a few months off. So I would rather take a few, a step or two back so that I could take 10 forward. And that's kind of what I, what I did. That's what I tell people too, is the, the difference between a setback and a step back, right? Taking a mm-hmm. step back, you know, is something you do to really take care of yourself or readjust or reset or whatever that is. And then moving forward, like you said. 
That's a great one. I'm gonna have to use that. <laughs> take it, take it. <laughs> so then um, how did you get to where you are now with Made by Many and making that move into a whole new company and what you're up to? So with the, the parameters that I came up with, and I'm more than happy to share it with you so you can share with the, the listeners, yes. but I came up with this uh, universe uh, on a spreadsheet. It was my job career universe, and it was an easy way for me to create some objectivity around my job search and look at how I was approaching each opportunity and what trade-off I was willing to make or going to make. And I started populating uh the document with places I aspirationally was excited about, you know, Apple was one place I was like, I like, you know, it's just a good product. I use a lot of their stuff. Nike's another one. You know, it's in my home state of Oregon. I love, you know, as an athlete wearing their stuff. And then I started doing some informational interviews, putting feelers out and I started populating these interesting opportunities that were kind of pro, you know, kind of coming to me like I'm kind of on defense and then other things I was going on offense and getting up on my toes. And as I was populating the document, two things really stood out to me. The first was a question of what am I trying to get out of this next job? Is it that I want to monetize a skill set I already have or do I want to learn something new? And then there's kind of a third way, which is like, how do I do a little bit of both? Mm -hmm. And very humbled after the failure of the tech startup down in Miami, realized that I knew how to make amazing, beautiful things sizzle for a few weeks in a campaign, but I didn't know how to build things that people actually wanted to use on a day-to-day basis. And that's where Made by Many had their strength. And that's where something like an Apple has a strength. And any really well-funded startup after like a B or a C series of funding has found a product market fit. And so I wanted to go to a place that understood that process so I could really be immersed in it. And then on the flip side, I said to myself, you know, I have this amazing reputation in the brand management, brand digital space. I have some great relationships that, you know, I'd love to be able to work with these brands again, these people again. And I know that they, they do business with me again, if, if we were to come together. So I thought, well, what if I bring that to the table to this made by many agency who is based in London, but wants to open up a U.S. office. And then in return, they're going to teach me the product side of things. And that's really why I chose the company, uh, you know, that, the combination of those two things was really important. Secondarily, great integrity in the leadership and the character of all four founders was very important to me after having gone through a very toxic founder mm-hmm. uh, situation. I, I was never going to do that again. I could if I wanted to, but it was just not worth my my happiness or anything. So uh, great integrity in the leadership really got along well with their founders and appreciated, you know, hey, they've been working at this. Now they're at, we're in our 10th year, but at the time it was the seventh year. I thought, hey, you know, they've been around, they've done good work. Uh, they're not the biggest on the block, but they are the best. And working with the best has always been one of my favorite things to do when it comes to a team. And other opportunities kind of fell away because you know some of the startups were wanting me to come in and kind of do what I had already done, which is a lot of content marketing. And I like to quote Jay-Z there. It was like, if you want my old shit, buy my old albums. Right. <laughs> I love it. You know, so it's kind of like, I want to get some yeah, new fresh some stuff. New, right? Yeah, yeah. It's kind of like probably when how Billy Joel felt when he went into classical music there for a hot second and was like, don't let me play Uptown Girl one more time. One more time, right. I've done right. it, I've done it, I've done it. <laughs> yeah, so I wanted to get onto a new phase and it wasn't just for my own boredom, but it was also, it's where the market's going. You know, it's about building utility. It's about thinking how digital experiences aren't just these one-off campaigns, but they're these ongoing relationships you have with the consumer if done well. Mm-hmm. And uh, that was exciting for me to be able to learn that that piece of it. And with Apple, although very amazing brand. It also was going to be fine with or without me. And my impact level was going to be very minimal. Whereas something like made by many, I knew that I could come in and make a demonstrative difference and big enough impact. And while I still have that fire in my belly and, and, you know, energy, and maybe I'll have that for the rest of my life. Maybe I won't. But for now, I knew that going to a larger corporation just wasn't in the cards for me just yet. So uh, with all those things, it just kind of like a on a beautiful mind when Russell Crowe's looking at all the code from the Russians and all that craziness. Like it was just this moment where it just popped out that it had to be this company because it satisfied so many of the KPIs that I had personally laid out that were important in this framework that I'm going to share with you. Yeah, I love that. I'd love to see that. I can't imagine what it looks like, but that would be interesting. It's an interesting way to think of it. It's It's beyond a vision board. It seems very strategic in how you figure out where you're going to go next. 
Yes. And, and, and adding objectivity to it. Otherwise kind of subjective sometimes, well, I like this about this thing and this about that thing. And right. it's like, you can kind of just argue in a circle and you really need to at some point be able to make some decisions about yourself and your career and your future. Now you said you came in in year seven, right? Of me by yes. me. And now this is your, been there three years, year 10? Two and a half. Yeah. Two so we're half. heading into year three. So what do you, for me and then 10 for the company. Yeah. So what do you love about it? Was it, obviously it was a good choice, but what do you love about what you're more so not than the company? What do you love about what you're doing now and who you are now, as far as keeping up your health and that kind of thing? I know you like to lift weights. I saw that. Yes. <laughs> uh, so the things about made by many that it makes sense now that I'm in, in the kind of un, under the hood, so to speak. But at the time, I didn't really think about it. The first thing is that there's this real deep philosophic integrity about what it takes to make great digital products. And there's no wavering from that. Whereas when I was in the campaign creative marketing world, you know, a client wants to make a last minute change or, you know, has this new idea or, you know, you're just kind of working through some sort of creative process. It's very, um, it's very chaotic and very, very subjective, whereas what we do at Made by Many is a very clear process and we follow it. We don't cut corners and we manage our clients' expectations. We educate them along the way and we, we really are very ruthless about prioritizing a feature set and making sure that it's all evidence-based, based on what users want, not based on some bosses, wife's, friends, girlfriends, right. whatever, right? Like right. There's, there's that you know kind of feedback that I used to get as a, a creative agency person like about a logo about, you know, that just had no grounding in reality, whereas that made by many, it's very grounded in reality. The flip side of that is that the growth that the company is capable of is pretty limited because we take on a certain set of projects and we're very careful to turn away any kind of work that hints at areas that we don't go into, like marketing and advertising or uh, with clients that have the potential to jeopardize our, our methodology and our process such that it would no longer represent like an outcome would no longer even look like an outcome that we would have made because the client would have overmanaged it or, you know, even under participated, you know, so you walk the, away from those, those mm -hmm. opportunities. So we leave, you know, we leave a good amount of projects and money on the table, but what we retain and hold on to is a very potent version of digital product building and also really venture development because we're trying to create the business model around that business. We're thinking about the operational aspect of what it takes to keep the thing going. So we, we design the whole venture, not just an object, right? We're, we're designing an outcome. So I've learned a lot about that and it's really cool. Sometimes it's a little frustrating because I have like this kind of drive and the scrappiness and I'm ready to kind of like, yeah, yeah, we can, we could figure we out how that. to do that. Yeah. We could do that, but you know, quickly put be put into check by our own business model, knowing the kind of talent we've employed and the kind of fees that we charge and the kind of expenses that we have associated with what it is that we do. We don't have just a bunch of freelance designers kind of hanging around or copywriters the way I did at Just Three. You know, we are full time staffed. We have very senior talent. We have people that are engineers and designers and product managers, and then that's it. Mm -hmm. So there isn't like these kind of utility players that could kind of swing in and pinch hit for, um, a client project that was a little outside of our wheelhouse. So that would be one of, and, and with that discipline and with that philosophic integrity comes ready for it, ready. well scoped projects that never go over time or over budget. Oh my God. It's amazing. <laughs> uh, and because of that, our business model is that everyone comes and puts eight hours in a day and then goes home. And can have so, a life. So I go home and I have a life. And so it, it all makes sense when you say it out loud, but it's very hard as an entrepreneur to get your get the right business model because a lot of your model is based on undercutting prices of someone else, or it's also because you're still naive to what exactly it takes financially and all the inputs. You know, you may price out just your labor and the labor of a freelancer, but what about the overhead? You know, if you've got co-working space, and then you know, what about m time and materials? What about any kind of computer or software that you have to have a license to use like Photoshop. So pricing things correctly so that you have enough money coming in to cover your core costs and pay people and that you're not requiring your model be one that the labor is 60, 70, 80 hours a week. 
because that's a broken model, mm -hmm. right? Nobody, and if, you've, if you're working people consistently at those hours, you really should be paying overtime, in which case now your model just got more expensive. Right. So having a good business model that you're able to stick to and deliver against and deliver within even is one of the greatest lessons I've learned by working here. And then I go home and I have a life and my email, it doesn't go off because nobody emails after six o'clock because everything we, there's nothing that we're working on that can't wait till tomorrow morning. Mm -hmm. I love that. Now, what about um, this idea of being able to leave some things on the table? Do you know if the company has been like that based on their business model from the beginning? And I ask because a lot of our listeners are, you know, either solopreneurs, small business owners, and this idea of sometimes of leaving things on the table, there's a fear that nothing else is going to come along, you know, especially if you're in the early stages and that kind of thing. So from your experience, what do you think? And, or even if you don't know the answer to from the beginning, What's the importance of making up your mind to say, this is my model, this is what I'm going to stick to without that fear? So the four founders came together to, to kind of form a more perfect union. And oftentimes when you found something, it's both in what you want to do, but also in opposition to what you don't want to do. Mm -hmm. And they were coming out of worlds in which they were working at agencies or working in consultancies, and they just... They didn't like how things were being scoped. They didn't like the um, the way that uh, an account person would come in and, and create kind of an obtuse layer on top of and obstruct, you know, the project between the project and the end client. And so when they did form this new constitutional kind of vision, it really eliminated the things they didn't love. And I know that that, that part of the DNA of to kind of like st stay true to digital products was really important to them. And along the way, there's certainly been a few projects here or there, um, even here in New York, we've taken on where we might redesign a website. And you're thinking, well, that's not really a digital product, although you could kind of argue it is. But by redesigning a website, we also think about, well, what does this CMS look like? And how does the actual updating, you know, and the whole process of keeping it maintained look? And then who is running that piece of it? And so all of a sudden you've created like a digital product for your client who's a marketing manager and has maybe 10 minutes a mm. week to spare. And like he or she like, like doesn't have the time to manage some sort of complex system. So you've really created something that has them in mind as the end user. And so we take a lot of pride in, again, thinking through the whole system. And so when we re redesigned Showtime's marketing website or OXO, the Good Grips kitchen gadget mm -hmm. people, uh, when we were to redesign those sites, we did so with a product mentality and we passed on our own thinking and skills to our clients so we didn't have to stay in maintenance mode. And those projects are ones that aren't exactly what we're in business to do, but because the clients were so awesome and because we were able to kind of bring our own uh, process to the table and the client respected it, it ended up going really well. And it was also important for us to be able to have that cash flow and to be able to um, you know, bridge ourselves to the next project that would have been like a full venture design. And we're very grateful for those opportunities. So I know, you know, we, we stray a couple degrees to the left or right. But, you know, as one can imagine, if you continue to say yes to the things to the left or right, you wake up in a year and you're something completely different. And some people love that. And that's what we did at Just3. But, you know, in other ways, there were times at Just3 where we stretched too far and too thin. We were in territory that we didn't really have best practices and protocols on how to go about it and it ended up costing us money. So we thought we were making money and we we're taking, you know, a check for 30 grand, but then it cost us about 45 grand to finish the project. And we're like, right. wow, we just, we just financed 15 grand of a fortune 500 right. and project countless because, hours, right? Countless hours and opportunity costs, because if you do say yes to something, it's going to be, it's going to fill up your dance card and not make you available for something that could be even more fitting for what you do. Right. Now, just a few more questions for you. If you had to tell our audience one digital product that they should pay attention to right now, new or old, um, what would it be? And I know there's tons out there. Technology is always changing. But what's something that, um, again, thinking from a either a solopreneur or a small business owner, what should we be thinking about? Wow. Uh, I mean, I really am just very bullish on the de on demand economy and create anything that can free up some of my time so that I'm able to spend that time with friends, family, getting some more sleep. So, you know, just Amazon, you know, all things Amazon going on there and being able to order stuff. You know, I have um, one of my, our clients here at Made by Many is called Alfred 
And in New York City, they come to your home twice a week and they take your laundry, they do your repairs, they take dry cleaning, take your packages. And it's only like 39 bucks a week, I think. And I have this Alfred client manager who her name's um, Sophia and she comes into my home and like we have a relationship and she knows kind of what I need. So she's helping me kind of take care of my home. Another one is Zeal in home massages. Mm -hmm. And that's such a treat because, you know, we all need to kind of de-stress a little bit. And you know, for a hundred bucks a month, you know, it's another place that's kind of like a micro luxury. <laughs> you know, you may not be able to be super rich and famous and have a massage every morning. Like I think Bob, Bob Hope used to get a massage every day. <laughs> uh, but at least you get one once a month in the comfort of your own home. So these are all these like products that I like using to kind of help free up some time and de-stress myself. So I don't have to do absolutely everything. One, and then just one product I'm super impressed with is Amazon Prime's video mm -hmm. product. I love, I'm such a pop culture junkie and I love when you hit pause, it'll show you the name of all the actors yes, and actresses. Yes, I love that too. I do it all the time now. I'm like pausing throughout yes. a whole series. What's the name again? What do they look like out of character? Exactly. And then you're <laughs> like, wasn't, weren't they in like the third season of Orange is the New Black? Yeah, exactly. or, and then you see them like pop up somewhere else. So oh, I love so that funny. game. It's so so funny. anyway. A game that we've made into a game that isn't really a game. <laughs> right. And it's something we we're probably doing with a second screen on IMDb and we're trying to right. come up with names. And, and I just think it's so cool that because clearly Amazon did some research and they, they feel, you know, they were able to find out that these are things that people were doing anyway. And they're like, well, we have the data. Right. Why not put it there? Yeah. So I'm pretty sure they own IMDb, I believe. Do they? Maybe. Yeah. They do, yeah. Oh, cool. Now, that, that's interesting because the products, I didn't think you were going to give things that support you personally, and which is yeah. great. No, I think that's good because it's sort of looking at what are the other things that can support you personally outside of business. Yes. And also, you know, realize that these are all, it's part of this economy where it's not itself a tech company. Like Alfred is not a tech company. Neither really is Amazon, but it's, it's technology that it, that it's put in place has given a great consumer experience for me and it gives them ability to manage a workforce or logistics at scale. Mm -hmm. And that's what I always like thinking about is like this tech enabled economy. Right. Like that's really where we are now. Like there's pure like software as a service like Oracle and Google and like things that are like tech technology code is the end deliverable. But for many of these things like food is actually like the restaurant is the company, but then their digital experience can either enhance the experience or you can leave, you know, that on the table. That's why we're, you know, someone like David Chang from Momofuku, he's got all these great new products. He's got maple. He's got another one that starts with an A where it's a, a delivery service of like a high quality, like kind of tasty food at a price point that every New Yorker is kind of paying for a meal anyway in that middle class working professional. I'm trying to think of kind of how to describe that demographic. Um, but it's that person who's paying about $12 Right. Uh, for their lunch and so they're capitalizing off of it with a great digital experience and then being able to manage demand and logistics and ingredients and inventory and all of that on the back end because they have the data right now one of the things that you wrote on medium I think this was in February that I really love it was um this idea of you were discussing sort of the personal brand and how the personal brand for people has sort of taken over or the the I guess it's been deified, as you said. And mm -hmm. one of your quotes was the thought leaders, quote unquote, thought leaders who are on the speaking circuit, uh, writing, promoting their next book and cranking out blog posts can't simultaneously be deep in the trenches doing the doing. And then you go on to talk about it a little bit more. So I wanted to just ask you this idea of the personal brand, which is something that we all hear so much about now, I think even more probably since you wrote it in, uh, in February. What is the um, what are the drawbacks of being focused on the personal brand and letting it sort of distract you, for lack of a better word? So the, the personal brand in its like purest, most beautiful like intention is this idea of, like it's your reputation. Like, what do people know you for? And, you know, I think about, you know, our grandparents' generation and, you know, what they were able to accomplish. And, you know, my, uh, on my dad's side, my, his parents were both teachers, you know, and their reputation with their, the parents of their kids were like, hey, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Bradshaw, they both, they both have educated my kids and helped prepare them for the next grade. And like, that's awesome, right? That's the reputation and that personal brand that they held was, was one of esteem in their community. Now, the overemphasis on the wrapper without making sure the substance, I'm kind of paraphrasing that Einstein quote that I, I put in that piece, you know, without 
like it would be so sad if the wrapper was better than the meat inside. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And, and so what I often see and, you know, want to kind of call out is that there are a lot of people who are espousing these thoughts on what needs to be done, what should be done. And from a very theoretical standpoint, now I don't mind if you're like a Malcolm Gladwell and you've got some dope theories that you're going to put out there and you've got some really great research to back you up. That that's totally cool. But if you're kind of a fly by night SEO expert, weird kind of Twitter bio talking about all these different hashtags for all the different expertises you have. And you know, you spend a good portion of your time posting blog posts on LinkedIn, Twitter and whatnot. And I just want to know, like, at what point do you test those theories? Like, Mm -hmm. are you not sleeping at all? Like, when are you getting the time, you know, kind of use that sports analogy, when are you getting your at bats? Like, are you, um, are you making sure to actually do that doing? Because that is ultimately the thing that will carry forward for your own brand. Because if you get a reputation of just being kind of, you know, a lot of uh, cowboy, or was it a a lot of hat, not enough cowboy, Mm -hmm. is what my, my dad would say. And, and so that's the danger. That's the flag I want to put out there. And then on the flip side, there are people that are just doing so much and they have no time, Mm -hmm. air quote time, you know, we're all busy to put out any thoughts, then they don't get any credit for that. And I've certainly, there was a point in 2010 when I was not doing a lot of blogging and I was just dutifully heads down on year four at just three. And I had a mentor, E. Katrina Walter at the time was with Intel. And, um, she said to me, Leslie, I know that you're behind a lot of these successful things and I don't hear your voice in this. And if you don't speak up now, you won't get credit. So on the flip side, I also want to talk to the doers for a second and say, hey guys and gals, like if you don't start putting at least one blog post up a month or every other month to kind of share some of the work product, or if you don't go on SlideShare and upload some of those decks that you've been building, uh, life will pass you by and you won't have a chance to really codify some of your thinking and contribute it to the larger discourse that's going on. And, you know, you also won't possibly, you know, get the, the call to be quoted in an ink article or have, you know, that you won't be top of mind for a reporter who wants to get, um, a real take on what's going on in something, you know, they, they, you know, reporters are actually really interested in genuine sources who have real lived experiences. And they're also interested in diversity. You know, they don't want to go back to the same five or 10 people. They also don't want to just talk to a bunch of white guys. So mm-hmm. people of color, women. They want to hear from all, all voices. And the only way that they're going to be able to find you is if you're findable. Right. And if you're out there putting out some interesting thoughts that are capturable. But I would say that I blog maybe once every three months. Wait. And I could probably do it a little bit more. It would be nice. But when I do blog, I have something to say. Right. Because that article was definitely, it wasn't like a short paragraph. You actually had an idea, theories, mapped out your thoughts on it. And then I think, is that something that you think is definitely important, as you said, for women, people of color, making sure that we get our voice out there and not just heads down in the work without saying, this is what I've created. This is my opinion. This is the research on it. Yes. And there's certainly the imposter syndrome. Like, well, what do I have to say right. that? you know, any different than what's already out there. It's like, what you have to say is from your vantage point, And that in and of itself is amazing. And there, I, I often get in this argument in my head, like, well, everybody's already figured out how to start a company. I don't need to be like the 12th, 100th blog post on this, but no one from a small town whose parents didn't go to college, you know, like there, that blog post maybe hasn't been written yet, Mm -hmm. you know, or a blog post from just a different, cultural standpoint or just a different voice at a different moment because everything spreads throughout the internet in waves and there may be someone out there seeking this information that just happens to bump into it on Twitter or a bank shot off of a Facebook post of a friend of a friend. So there's always a valid time. And, you know, I look at my analytics and, you know, I'll sometimes get 500 reads, but uh, two of those reads will be people who will reach out to me and say, this is exactly, this is water to a desert. I needed to hear this. Thank you. And that that'll keep you going. Mm -hmm. And even if someone doesn't actually find it and reach out to you, it now becomes a little bit of your ammo that should you be doing outreach for a new job or even client nurturing and cultivation, or even pitching yourself to a conference as a speaker or trying to reach out and get an opportunity to be a a contributor at a place like Inc or entrepreneur, you now have fodder and Mm -hmm. you can you can send that link and say, well, this is a a recent piece that I put together and it'll kind of give you a flavor of my thinking and what I'm going to bring to the table. And oftentimes that's what they're looking for. They just want a little bit of proof that you've already done this so that they can de-risk involving you. And if you don't have anything, if a tree falls in the forest and nobody heard it, you have a great idea, a great methodology, but you've never externalized it and 
you know, kind of created an artifact on the internet, then it kind of never happened. Right. And that's exactly how I found you. Danielle recommended you like, gee, you have to talk to her. And I I looked up and I was like, I absolutely have to talk to her. She's fantastic. Well, thank you. We bumped into each other. I'm glad we did. Yeah. So I'm going to wrap up. I know you have to go. Um, Last question. If you think over your life and career and you had the chance to thank only one person whose support was critical to you personally or professionally, who would that be? And what would you say? Oof. even though my dad is the businessman in our family, like he's kind of run companies and managerially I've like architected myself leadership wise after him. It was my mom who really fought for me to go to a private university that was going to cost more money. And my dad didn't quite understand it because he didn't go to school and he thought, you know, why can't she just go in state? And, and my mom got it. She knew that if I was going to go to the university of Chicago and be able to go and have, this life that they didn't have, that it was going to open a lot of doors. And even when I picked a major, you know, I concentrated in gender studies with a, a minor in, you know, econ and other stuff. My dad's like, gender studies, what, what are you doing? Like, what's, what kind of jobs can you get with that? And my mom just trusted and believed that I was going to learn how to write well, research, analyze, synthesize, speak, have my mind exercise, my brain in really good shape so that I could kind of take on anything and be ready for a new economy. Like who knows what kind of jobs are coming down at us. And I, it's much, much better that you know how to, th- how to think critically than be super vocationally driven. Um, doesn't work for every type of person. I think vocational schools are all, also very, very important and give people a clear track. But my mom always knew that I was a creative person and she put me in everything from dance to pottery to painting. I just remember my whole childhood, I just have fond memories of just doing creative, cool things that I wanted to do. And she was the one dropping me off, picking me up, buying the supplies, getting the right shoes. I mean, when we couldn't afford it, she made sure that I had a hundred dollar volleyball shoes for Nike Mm -hmm. from, from Nike so that I could play and and be like all the other girls. Right. And like that, that kind of sacrifice and that kind of encouragement and support. That's shout out to my mom. Shout out to mom. We love mom. Yeah, mom. Awesome. Mom's the best. Mom's the best. Awesome. Yeah. Now tell everyone how can we support you? I'll have links to everything, but tell us where to find you and that kind of thing so people can check you out. So I'm Leslie Bradshaw at L E S L I E B R A D S H A W on all the social media. But I've been thinking about this question, and my way that you can support me is you pay it forward. You pick two people every year that you're just going to make a big difference in their lives. Mm. It might include a little bit of financial support. You know, you might send them to a conference. You might spend a little extra time, regular coffees and mentoring sessions, but you do that. And then they do the same thing. We all do this for 40 years. Next 40 years, we all go do this individually. I will impact 850,000 people and you will impact 850,000 people. So I really, I'm a big fan of paying it forward because at this point I feel like I've got, more than I've ever had hoped for. And, you know, I want to make sure that that is spread and shared as many people. And also, you know, pick in as many ways possible, diverse audiences. And that also includes bridging into some, you know, paths and places. You know, I I think of um, the positions and places of power are held by mostly white men that are older. And if we don't bridge our way into those networks and they'll never know about us. And, you know, I have a good male friend and mentor of mine, who loves catching up once a month and asks me, you know, like I'm thinking about who should be on my board. Like, who do you know? I was like, well, actually I know this amazing woman and she's got a law degree and she was working at Google and Warby Parker. And, you know, she also happens to be a woman of color and they met for breakfast. He said, she's going to be my next board seat as soon as I get a phone call. And nice. there's those conversations that we need to have with people that don't look like us. So it's good to come together and like get all the women together and be like, girl power. Mm-hmm. And like, people call like people, you know, people call it power, but at the same time, we need to bridge into the other networks so that we can make sure that those networks are as diverse as we need and want them to be. And they only will be when they know people that look, don't look like them. So pay it forward and bridge out into networks that don't look like you. <laughs> I love that. I was going to ask you for a parting piece of advice. Do you think that's it? Yeah. That sounds that's really it. Yeah, good. <laughs> that's it. I was trying to think, it was like, you had some great questions and I think it's a hybrid of the two. It's like, yeah. you don't know, need to support me, support other people. And then that's, my advice, pay it forward and bridge out. That's excellent. Leslie, thank you so much. I really appreciate you. That was fantastic. Thank you. It was a lot of fun. Hold on one second. 
All right. I hope you enjoyed that episode. Thank you so much for listening. What you can do now is go over to support is sexy podcast.com to find other episodes with other inspiring women entrepreneurs that I've interviewed in the past. Check them out there. And while you're there, please also make sure that you subscribe to my email list so that you don't miss an episode. You don't miss any of the great resources that I share with people. I won't spam your inbox, only the good stuff. So be sure to go to support is sexy podcast.com. Click on subscribe at the top and sign up for our email list. And until next time, you know what to do. Go out there and create something sexy and I'll talk to you soon. Take care.